maybe. There it goes. <laughs> hey, it's Bill from Build the Scene. Tonight, I am talking to Stevie, Tina, and Charlie, and possibly John if he shows up, who are all performing tomorrow night at the um, SOS Concert Series Season 2 Week 2 <laughs> Concert, which is Blues Night. Um, for more information on how to watch that live stream, you can go to um, SOS2020PGH.org slash concerts. And this will not be the first time I mention it. It's also scrolling across the bottom um, with tomorrow's date and the purchase information. It's $10. That gets you access to this season, last season, and uh, I want to say s over 70 music videos. Um, the last time I, I looked, I think there were 72 of them. Um, so $10 gets you an access, access to a lot of local music. And it benefits the Neva Emergency Relief Fund. So it is a great cause. So if this is the first time you're hearing about it, please go to SOS2020PGH.org. I'm really having trouble with that tonight. Slash concerts and find out more information about um, tomorrow's concert. The other three that, including tomorrow, that remain in season two. Um, it, you can also find out about the first four in season one. And again, it's 10 bucks. Okay, commercials out of the way. <laughs> so, uh, I kind of warned you ahead of time that some of my questions are off the wall. Um, <laughs> and, and I have this new question that's like perfect for Blues Night. Um, recently, I watched a documentary on Robert Johnson. So the question is, if you were waiting at the crossroads for the devil to show up, what would you be there to ask him for? <laughs> and if that's a little bothersome for you, then you could just tell me what your biggest musical dream is. <laughs> Stevie's... <laughs> Stevie's face. <laughs> mm hmm. That's why I said you could also just tell me your biggest musical dream. That way you don't have to trade it. Um, this, this one hopefully isn't as hard for you <laughs> and it's not as off the wall either. Can, can each of you pinpoint that moment where you knew that you wanted, wanted to play the blues? <laughs>
NFTs, they they made me feel different, you know, I, and I didn't know why. Just something, something, you know. And, and Steve, you touched on that, the feel of it, and it blues music is very much first and foremost, in my opinion, about feel. And uh, and there were certain tracks on these, you know, the uh, Zeppelin and the Allman Brothers and and uh, you know several others that just sounded and, and felt different. And I come to find out that, you know, well, those are blues songs, you know, that those blues progressions and that groove. And I didn't know anything about blues. You know, it's like I was a rock and roll guy. Um, but one year, my uh, my older brother asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And uh, and I told him, well, get me a Muddy Waters record. Now, I'll be the first to admit at the time, I really had no idea who Muddy Waters was, shame on me, but I was a young kid, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I just saw his name somewhere in, a, in an interview with someone as being an influence. So I thought, well, with a name like Muddy Waters, he's, he's got to be badass. So, <laughs> so I asked my brother for a Muddy Waters record and, and uh, lo and behold, Christmas morning, I, I saw the LP under the tree and I, I tore it open and I ran into my room and it was one of his one of the ones he did in the latter part of his career that were uh, uh, produced by Johnny Winter. I think it was uh, Hard Again. I think it was the first of the ones that Johnny Winter did. James Cotton on harmonica and Willie Big Eye Smith and yes. Pine Top Perkins. I mean, it was phenomenal. I dropped the needle on that sucker. And as soon as that started and a Cotton's harp just blaring and that, that groove, I am not making this up. Every hair on my teenage body stood at attention. I and I knew right at that, that was the moment, Bill. I knew at that point, like, this is, this is, this is it. This is, you know, if I could only listen to one kind of music ever again, it would be this. And, uh, and that started the journey where I would, um, you know, I would, I would start scouring these LPs and the labels on the records and where it had the, uh, the credit for the songwriter next to the song and I would go seek out those songs that made me feel differently. And I saw names like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, M Morgan field, you know, and, uh, C Burnett and, uh, R Miller and R Johnson. I'm like, yeah. So I, so I kind of set out on a, on a quest to find out who, who are these people? And, uh, and that was, that was very much the beginning. Uh, and a side note, uh, y fast forward years later, this was probably a couple of years before James Cotton passed away. I was at a, a, a giant harmonica event out in the Midwest and he was, he showed up on the last night as a special guest because they gave him a, a special reward or award. And, uh, and I got a chance to go talk to him briefly and introduce myself. And I told him that story and, and he just like got the biggest, brightest smile on his face. And uh, you know, I, I didn't have, because I was so starstruck at the time, I didn't have the wherewithal to get him to, you know, sign a harmonica or get my picture with him. But that smile is burnt into my brain. And uh, that was something that I, I'll, what a I'll wonderful cherish. Story. That's a wonderful story. Oh, my gosh. That's so, so I have to admit something. <laughs> For some reason, I had you guys mute it. <laughs> so... They didn't hear the question about being in the crossroads and Stevie and Tina, <laughs> Stevie and Tina, they didn't hear your answer to that question. Good. <laughs> okay. All right. Shall I repeat what I said? If I can remember. Yeah, I remember. I said at the crossroads, I, crossroads, I would not ask the devil for anything because I know there would be a price to pay if I ask him for any kind of a favor. In the end, it might not be good. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'll have a happy ending after that. So, yeah. <laughs> And then um, they, they also didn't hear your your um, beginnings in the well, blues. Well, mine was, you know, uh, I'd ask him for a tour. Although I agree with what Stevie said. <laughs> Don't want to make a deal with the devil. No, no, no. And, I'll, oh, and about starting with the blues. Yeah. Oh, oh so I, I think. Basically, uh, we missed the first two questions. <laughs> well, Whoops. okay. Let's see. <laughs> I, I was, as coming up, I was listening to R and B and 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 mostly R and B and um, 
gospel and things like that and records. My parents had blues records and all that. And I came to blues late in life, but I realized that, you know, gospel, blues, R&B, it all came from, all that came from blues. Everything that you're hearing came from the blues. So I, I said I came in blues late in life. Maybe I didn't. It was already there. In here. So. You're there now. I'm there now. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, I like the blues. I, I like it. I really do. Like I said, I, I love all genres of music. And I've been blessed to be able to do all of them. Yeah. All right, so, Tina, we, we need your blues beginnings, and then we need Char my blues. Charlie's answer about, about the, the crossroads. <laughs> okay, does Charlie want to give his answer about the crossroads? Ladies first. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. So, as I said, um, my blues began when I was a little girl. My dad and my granddaddy played, and they were from down south, and that was the thing they did all the time on the front porch, and it was gospel. Everybody sang gospel. It was very big and that just always stuck with me. I like I like to sing it, I like the way it sounds and I like the way it makes me feel. And as I said, I do rock and roll with my band, blues, Southern rock, but definitely the blues has always been part of me. I, I love singing with the women of the blues. I'm, I'm excited to do this with the ladies again for tomorrow night and looking forward to it. Hey, Charlie, you, you meet the devil at the crossroads. What, what are you gonna do? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I don't want nothing he's selling. <laughs> but if, if if forced to, uh, I would I not 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 necessarily anything for myself. I would love for the spirit and the essence of people like Robert Johnson and those uh, forefathers of this genre of music could be. Uh, sprinkled into the minds and the hearts and souls of all the current players, especially the younger folks uh, who are, who take a liking to this type of music so that they would um, know, know where it came from and, uh, and keep it, keep that reverence for the music. Uh, Cause sometimes I see it not going, not going in that direction. And that's, uh, that's a little bothersome, but uh yeah, that's that's what I would ask for. The, the you know just the uh, the essence of those early blues uh, innovators, and mm -hmm. uh, you know just maybe a little of their pain could be shared, and so that people know that hey, this you know this this ain't this ain't no uh, cartoon. Thank you. Uh, I think it's Thank awesome you. that you mentioned cartoons because now I'm going to ask you a cartoon question. Oh, Segway. Uh -oh. <laughs> so there's a band in the Pittsburgh scene called um, the Shadow Event, and the lead singer's name is Christina Santavica. And I'm telling you this ahead of time because she came up with this question, and you can blame her if you ever meet her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I know who she. Is. I don't know her though. All right. So the question is, if they were ever going to put you into a cartoon, what cartoon would you be in? So, like, Scooby-Doo, Looney Tunes, something, or something obscure, or, you know, where do you fit in? The Roadrunner. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to be the Coyote, or are you going to be the Roadrunner? <laughs> I'm the Roadrunner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. The Roadrunner. Oh. What would I do? Not too many cartoons. Well, except for the Black Panther, that'd be one. It was a comic book. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's kind of weird. Oh, I'd be Bugs Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Was, oh. He's a he's a he's a wise wise. Can I say it? wise ass? <laughs> that, I, you know, wise. I, I, that yeah. Mm -hmm. Charlie, don't say Elmer Fudd. <laughs> <laughs> no, although you know you're right, those old Warner Brother cartoons. There's nothing like them. That in the Hanna nothing Barbera like early on, they don't make on. them like that anymore. They don't. But they if do if I could insert myself into a cartoon world, I would love to meet Jessica Rabbit because she is the hottest cartoon ever. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. That's, that's okay. That's, that's 
Yeah, I get it. We get it. <laughs> All right. So a few years ago, I went to Chicago to watch the Penguins play against the Blackhawks in an outdoor game. And I'm a huge Penguins fan. And, you know, I expected to go there and like that to be the highlight of, of my trip. Well, it turns out my highlight was actually going to Buddy Guy's Legends and, and eating lunch there. And just there was a, a single guy up on stage with his acoustic guitar playing the blues. And I didn't want to leave. My brother made me. <laughs> so What was his name? I can't remember, which is terrible. He was young. Um, he's definitely younger than me. Um, that was probably, I was probably like 40 and that was probably at least four or five years ago. So I don't know. He was probably late twenties, early thirties, hmm. but, but he was good. And really the only regret I had about being at buddy guys was that I was drinking RC cola, <laughs> 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 but what is a moment that, like, for me, that that's my blues moment, sitting there watching this guy on stage. And it, it was just, you know, I was there for the hockey game, and, and I talk about that moment more than I do anything else that happened. Um, so is there a moment in the blues that has just really stuck with you over the years? Yes. I'll, I'll go first. Um, I was, was a while back. Uh, I was watching a HBO documentary um, put on by Martin Scorsese called Lightning in a Bottle. I don't know if anybody saw Lightning in a Bottle. If you haven't, check it out. It had, there, a lot of them are gone now. A lot of blues legends were in that show. And it started, um, and it started out how it started giving you the history of the blues how it started, you know, the music in Africa. And then it started, you know, pictures and things of slaves. And you got to remember the chain gang too. The chain gangs had, there's actual music you can get from chain gangs. There's, there's, there's music and it's powerful, sad, powerful, but a lot of it's not, you know, like I said, it comes from a certain place. Well, anyway, it starts there. And then they have these, Everybody coming up, people that I, you know, um, uh, Ruth Brown came up, Odetta came up. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And these men um, that were performing, you know, the old, the, the, there are a lot of, a lot of them are gone. B.B. Uh, King, of course, is on there. Um, uh, my girl Natalie Cole sang some blues uh, 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 from the Staples Singers. Mavis Staples was on it. But like I said, it's going back there and the musicians were fabulous. All these musicians, you know, Neville Brothers, all all this music that they had. And when I watched this older gentleman who was a blues player, and this was at Madison Square Garden, the show was filmed. And he said that he would clean. He was a blues guy, but but he, you know, was I guess a janitor there at one at one time. And for him to be able to sit there, because it was a right, he had a song, his songs that he sang. And he was there on stage after cleaning, you know, having to clean the place, was there on the stage. And he did this song. And um, and it broke my heart listening to him play the guitar and sing the song. Broke my heart. And I just listened. And the whole, the whole show, just brings you to, I guess, I don't know, Jesus moment. I'm not sure, but the whole show, all these musicians, all these people who started off performing blues as kids, you know, how they came up and the struggle was real and the heartache that they went through, all of them, and how they all got, were getting together in the stage in this back room and how they all knew each other. And how some of them never met before, but they all knew each other. And they had this, this, this thing in common. It was the most beautiful, sad, painful. It was wonderful thing I'd ever seen in my life. And that's, like I said, that feeling of that blues is, is immense. It's, it's big. And it was big when I watched that, 
when I watched that show and I watched it over and over and over and over again. And you have to check it out. If you haven't seen it, it's called Lightning in a Bottle. I think you can either Google it, Google it or YouTube it, or I think you have to buy it or something like that. But it's, it's an excellent show. So that did it for me. That that put me in the spot where um, I understood. It was come to that understanding of all of it. I think it's music in a period, not the one, four, five. It's more than just a one, four, five. Everybody, for those who don't know what that means, well, yeah, it's a music term for blues. And it's more than just that. So it's watch the evolution of the blues, you know. So Strange Fruit was a blues song. Okay. That was, it was blues. It was pro, it was also a protest song as well. But yeah. yeah. It wrecks me every time. Wrecks me every time. And they show, mm -hmm. you know, that. so that's what the blues is. Yeah. That's how I got, that's what blues has done for me, I guess you'd say. So. I think I have to agree and underline what you said, like watching documentaries on how, you know, blues, you know, came about and just, um, how it makes you feel. It's definitely a lot different than a lot of other genres I listen to, although I like all of them. It's just really deep and intense and it really gets to your soul because there's so much meaning and passion behind it. And I didn't see the show you're talking about, but I have heard about that show. You have to watch for yourself. That's, that's, watch for yourself. Then you will understand I mean, from the beginning to the end. And I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's joyous. It's it's all it's it's everything it's everything all it's the American experience I guess you'd probably yeah. would say and um, and to exalt these people who from what from what it came from is right the biggest <laughs> you know it's it's because a lot of people don't really know they really don't know and the thing is understand what you're what why music came about understand what you're singing and why certain songs were written mm -hmm. so yeah what you got to say charlie <laughs> no i'm not uh, sorry uh, oh bill i'm sorry i asked no. i did not mean to ask you i step on your toes i asked a question sorry I like to <laughs> you're fine <laughs> we're howard stern now and robin right <laughs> we're in the interviews Listen, I'm constantly, <laughs> constantly telling people that I have yet to find a host for my show. You know, the 16 year old one. <laughs> oh, keep looking, Bill. <laughs> keep looking. Uh, there were a couple things that um, kind of hit me at that level uh, that Stevie was talking about. One was. Uh, Several years ago, I was uh, doing a little tour down through the South with a couple of friends, and uh, we played at a, a place called the Blue Biscuit in Indianola um, in Mississippi. And um, the owner gave us tickets to the B.B. King Museum, which is right, like right down the street from her, from her venue. And uh, we got there, it was kind of late, so I didn't get a chance to spend nearly as much time as I'd like to, but just going back and looking at videos and reading articles and looking at photographs that kind of portrayed um, that, uh, you know, what they were doing in the midst of the oppression that was very prevalent at the time. And, uh, you know, and they, you know, they persevered mm -hmm. and thank, thank heavens, you know, all that, all that stuff was recorded for anybody to, um, you know, to study today. Uh, and the other thing that the other moment I was driving back from uh, visiting a, a Cajun friend of mine in Eunice, Louisiana, and uh, I have a friend in, who lives uh, near Jackson, Tennessee, and he had told me that um, there was a little cemetery where John Lee Williamson was buried. Now, John Lee Williamson was the original Sonny Boy Williamson. He was, he's the harmonica player 
who went to Chicago and he's credited with influencing people like little Walter and a lot of the other major players. Uh, he was, he was the innovator. And, um, so my, my friend JD had told me that at some previously in a few, few years before that, uh, people had taken up a donation and got him a really nice headstone. So when I was driving back through Jackson, I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can find this place, you know, and I looked it up online and I found the, you know, the area and the name of this cemetery is a little cemetery where the chapel used to be that, that he attended as a, as a kid. And uh, they had moved the chapel somewhere else as in, you know, set it up like a historical site. It's not at the cemetery anymore. So I find the cemetery and it was, you know, it's nice, well kept and everything. And, you know, and I walked through it and looked at every stone three times and I couldn't find it. I had a picture of it and I couldn't find it. And uh, so I was just getting ready to get back on the road and, and, you know, give up thought I was at the wrong place. And I looked across the, the rolling hills and I saw what looked like a headstone or two in, in the woods. And that's when it hit me. I was like, of course, this is the white section yes. of the cemetery. Yes. So yeah. I, I rolled down the road and I walked up through waist high weeds and there were all these stones laying on their side, uh, unmarked or worn away from, I mean, there were stones there from the 19th century. And, uh, and I wandered around and I found uh, Sonny Boy's new tombstone. And uh, man, it was, that was like a, a, a kick in the gut. You know, it was, uh, you know, I just, I, what can I do? I stood there and, you know, that one of my harmonicas on the stone and took a couple of pictures and, you know, and just kind of like, just kind of reveled in, in the history that was around me. And not only just him, obviously him in particular as a harmonica player, he's, he's one of the innovators and forefathers that we talk about. Uh, yeah. But just the, the heaviness and the weight of, you know, of that segregation, which, you know, was, so common and, and expected then, but, you know, to, to someone like me living in today's day and age, especially this far North, shocking and heartbreaking. And uh, yeah, those, yeah, those things like that, you know, that's, uh, again, it, that brings it, that raises the, uh, you know, the uh, importance of this music and uh, the importance of, of holding it in, in high esteem because of where it came from. Thank you for that. It's a good story. Thank you for that. That's that's what it. That's a lot of what I've been trying to, to tell a lot of people. Um, you know, these it wasn't that you know they were blues people and like they are right now. You know, everybody's all popular and so on and so forth. It's not like if they and these people didn't get any money for it, what they did, and a lot of no, the they didn't. Was, no, they didn't. A lot of the music was taken from them. Uh, you know, it was taken, just taken. Yes, it was. And made somebody so somebody else could record it and make money from it. Mm -hmm. And it still goes on, but you know, I guess a lot of people, you know, don't try. Or we want our music, you know, that kind of thing. We're not letting you take it. But that uh, that happens. That's happened throughout the years, through, you know, I mean, centuries, I'd, I'd say. And because um, I, you know, I've listened to records. I had a friend of mine who gave me a, a, a anthropologist friend of mine gave me um, some records and they were called race records and things that yeah, said Yeah, that's them. what they call them. That's what they called them. And I'm listening to this and wow, yeah. I mean, and it's so old, but you can hear it. I mean, I'm listening to this music, this is some great stuff. But, you know, you, you, but like I said, you know, you hold hold them up, hold these people up to a higher, high esteem, put them on, on that pedestal, because if it wasn't for them, none of this we'd be, we're doing now would never have come about. Yeah. So what, we, what did Willie never, what did Willie Dixon it. say? Willie Dixon said the blues is the roots and everything else is the fruits. Exactly. It is. It is. Ain't no lie. Love, it's it's no lie. But like I said, you know, it, it comes it comes from 
across the, you know, across the ocean. And he came here. And it just, you know, it, it, however it happened, it flourished. I guess you'd have to say that, you know, because it, it just came from the condition, from a human condition. Yeah. How bad as it was. But uh, you know, it's a wonderful music, and I'm 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 proud to be you know I'm, I am proud to be a, you know have that heritage, and uh, and I'm glad that people can recognize that and just understand this is all this music you got your rock, your you know all that stuff it it has to start somewhere and it started right. started there at that point. So yep. So. Yeah. This next question I've been waiting to ask, and the more that you guys are, are speaking, the more I'm getting excited about it. Um, <laughs> so if you could go back in time without breaking the space-time continuum, for so Dr. Brown doesn't yell at you. Um, okay, good. You got it. <laughs> And, okay. yeah. and, and, yeah. and you can meet with any musician in the history of the world. Who would you meet with? But the, the, there's a caveat. You can only ask that person one question. So who would you meet with and what would you ask them? Wow, that is a tough question. Hmm. I kind of combined two of my questions. <laughs> What question? Oh, this is a tough question. Yeah, I, I, I have. Well, there's several people I'd like to meet and ask them a question. One question. Well, go ahead. You, you can, you can do several. We have time. Okay. <laughs> first one, be the first one. I, my heart, Jimi Hendrix. I, I adored him because he played the blues. Let him folks be known. Um, I, I. I just would like to to would ask him. Um, where he came up with, I guess, um, his ideas, and because I, I like the way he's saying because he's saying from here too. He wasn't a singer, not really. He wasn't a great vocalist. His guitar playing was so I could feel it. To the point that I would be in tears. That's that's the kind of artist he was to me. I don't know about anybody else, but I, whatever pain he was having, I was feeling it too. But I, I would, I would ask him, you know, what was so painful for you? Because some, because sometimes you know, like comedians, they're so funny, but it's born out of pain. They're, they're you know, comedic. Thing is for our pain. I would ask him that. And then I would talk to Bob Marley. All right. He was one of my heroes. He's just, I don't know. He was just a prophet hero for me. So that's that's totally different. That's, that's not blues. It's a little reggae. Yeah, I, I, I love reggae. That's that that popped me back. Um Ska and stuff like that. There was years ago, probably 2004, 2005, on Pennsylvania Rock Show, um, J.J. Smith was here. Um, he was in Ziggy Marley's band, and he was in my living room. It was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, he, oh, my God. He was a friend of a friend, and it, my friend was like, hey, I know this guy. I'm like, bring him. <laughs> bring him. Yeah, gee, I wish I'd have been there. Whew. That must have been amazing. I'm still trying to think like who I would want to meet. Charlie, would you come up with somebody? Uh, you know, I could think of a, a whole list of blues musicians that I would love to go and um, watch perform. But I, I mean, I don't know what I would say to them. I mean, I don't know what kind of question I would have for them. Um, some of them I would just like to go and be around. I mean, I would... You know, I'd I'd love to 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 hang out with with Muddy Waters for an afternoon and uh, chat with him and uh, you know, sure. dare I say, play a play a song with him. Um, another another guy that I am just really drawn to, just 
his style and 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 uh he's not even a harmonica player it's a mississippi john hurt um Ooh, sorry just i uh, yeah it's the same way i feel stevie it's, ooh, i hear his playing and his singing and it is just so chill and there's nothing i mean there are people who could play those licks and that style but like that was his and you know uh like a lot of these a lot of these cats they were phenomenal players but they weren't very nice people uh and rightfully so, they got, you know, they got a lot of hard knocks and they learned how to give it back. Yeah, um, true. But, you know, John Hurt, to me, just always seemed like this humble guy that, you know, I could imagine him as being approachable. And I, I don't know if he was or not. I would think so. When they, when they found him in the resurgence and the folk and the blues resurgence and they went they had no idea where he was. He only had a handful of early recordings and uh, they went to the town that he mentioned in one of his songs and just start asking around. And they, and the people said, Oh yeah, he lives down the road in that shack on the left. And uh, you know, and they went and found him and he, and he thought they were pulling his leg. He's like, what do you mean? They want to hear my music. <laughs> so he just, but I love his style. I love his, his vocals and his guitar playing. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah. if I could hang out, if I got to hang out for a weekend with somebody, I'd go back and and sit with him on his porch and, uh, you know, and wake up and have uh, bacon and eggs and greens with him in the morning. <laughs> there you go. Sounds like a... Oh, I think I, that I wanted to, if I would go back, who I would want to meet, because I, I just always admired and just always thought what a tough woman is Etta James. But I want to know how she how she put herself in the place with the men around her because she was a she seemed like a strong woman i like her music um i sing some of her stuff so i think that's who i would probably be interested in meeting like i could just see like hanging out on the porch with her and drinking <laughs> <laughs> singing music <laughs> All right, so I think she's great. I mean, she's definitely got a different voice and she's done a lot of songs that are, you know, everybody's doing, to, everybody does them today. Yeah. I, you know what? Female. I, I would love, I would love to just sit there and talk to Big Mama Thornton just for a yeah. second. Or, or not just her. Uh, um, play guitar. Can't think of her name. I mean, I have to wonder, like, how the other woman's name that plays guitar. Um, uh, a sister, um, Rosetta. Rosetta Thorpe. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> now, I would just, I would just like just sit and just. Yeah, you're right. Like you said, just sit and talk. Just sit. I would just sit and talk and listen, let her play. We just and just have a good time. That. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a great question, Bill. But you know, is, uh, I'm sitting here racking my brain, and I can't, I yeah, can't. I mean, I can think of people I'd like to hang out with. I can't think of one specific question that I would ask any one person. I mean, like, how do you even approach that? Right. So, so, but I would love, I would love dearly to hang out with some of them. So this next question has kind of become a thing on my podcast. Um, it started out as a joke and now I'm really trying to do it. Um, so when I'm watching stuff on YouTube within five videos, there's either a video of the Foo Fighters or a video of Dave Grohl, who's the lead singer of the Foo Fighters. So yeah. I started bringing that up on my show and um, I came up with the question to go along with it, but I've started tagging him trying to get him on the show. Um, but the question is, who is your Dave Grohl? And what I mean by that is the Foo Fighters are known, like when they're playing, you know, they're playing at Wembley and they see someone holding up a sign saying, I want to play whatever song of theirs. And they bring them up on stage and hand them a guitar and let them play. So by, by asking you, who is your Dave Grohl? I'm asking what musicians would you want to go up on stage with and, and play one of their songs with them? See, it's first. another hard one, right? <laughs> yeah. You go first, Charlie. <laughs> is this is this <laughs> thanks? I was waiting for that. Uh is this living or living or dead, Bill? It, or uh, it, it can be any. 
doesn't matter. Um, huh. Well, I mean, like all the all the great harmonica players, the current ones that are out there touring that I um, revere and admire, um, I I wouldn't want to embarrass myself by sitting in with them. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, as far as living, I you know, and I this just goes to. You know, in my opinion, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of the uh, the classic blues style, the Chicago blues style, and anything traditional. Uh, I'm not really big on contemporary anything because I'm an old school or, or just old, if you prefer. Um, so, but um, yeah. as far as uh, as far as current players, uh, Kim Wilson, in my opinion, is the best at playing this style. Um, I don't know if I'd want to be on this bandstand with him, but I sure wouldn't mind taking his band for a drive. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so that would that would be uh that would be quite intimidating. But um yeah, I mean he, he ranks right up there, you know, as far as uh not living, you know, certainly any of those uh any of those classic bands from Chicago in the you know, in the fifties and sixties, like you know, the Aces who uh, were uh, Little Walter's band, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, or or any any iteration of Muddy Waters band. He always had a, an amazing uh, knack for finding the perfect pieces for, for his ensembles. I think if I were to get up on stage with somebody, I would want to get up on stage with Aretha Franklin and just watch her <laughs> and maybe do some <laughs> but I like Aretha Franklin. I would love to get on stage with her. And and if I could get on stage and sing and somebody play for me, I think I would want to do that with like B.B. King. I watched him play with Susan Tedeschi, who I love Susan Tedeschi. And, and it was just the way he handled her and the way he was with her on the stage. It was, it was endearing for me. I don't know if anybody ever saw that, but um, it just seems like a really gentle soul yeah. and make comfortable on the stage. I, I, I think I would like to be on stage with Keb Mo. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's badass. You <laughs> I, might, you might I, one day, Evie, you never know. I, I, that would be so cool having him play and just do, I'll sing something together or he just play and I say, what I, 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 yeah, him and um, what's my girl Ruth Brown? I like she's she was. I mean, listening to her, just I would just like to be up on stage, just watching her and do her thing. You know, just you learn. That's how we we learn from these folks. I but to be on stage or just sitting right on the sidelines, like you know, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yes, that that would. Oh, yeah, yeah, but Kebbo, I, I would love to be on stage with him. He's he's got that it, you know. He's he's got it. Now I I, I enjoy listening to him, and I and I'd like to see him live. So, but be on stage with him. Yeah. I'll <laughs> have I'll have my sign up. <laughs> Can I sing with you? <laughs> See what you should say. You're my Dave Grohl. Can I come on? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. Oh sorry. And then, and then you have well, to explain I, it. You didn't have to explain this. Like, what the heck are you talking about? But it'll draw his attention. Like who's Dave Grohl? <laughs> yeah. Probably knows. I'm sure ever. He probably, a, I'm yeah. sure he knows. But yeah. But I. But I'll. I'll yeah. <laughs> um. So this next one is kind of. It's kind of a songwriter's question. So. But but it's coming from me, so it's an odd one. <laughs> so, and it's not a stretch. It's let's say that there's an apocalyptic event, <laughs> and and it wipes out the majority of the humans on Earth, and there's a handful of humans left, and it also takes out all but one song from every band. Which song? Hmm. Which song that you either wrote or you perform would you want to to be involved in repopulating the earth? 
And you can read into that last part however you want. <laughs> Let's see. Well, we've been writing a lot of music while this pandemic. Yeah. While well, while the pandemic is going right to music. Well, I'll tell you what. If, it, if I was to write something just just for the, if it was apocalyptic and it was the last, you know, people and whatever. And um, I probably write something happy, like all my debt is gone. <laughs> I have no more debt. Won't need no more money. <laughs> that kind of thing. Oh yeah, all my debt's gone. I don't have these bills to pay anymore. Oh yeah, that's that's yeah. And, <laughs> and if you're young, you'll be happy too. You don't have to worry about. I'll teach you whatever you want. You don't have to worry about school debt. Yeah, and because I'm too old to be trying to repopulate anything at this point. <laughs> I say that all the time. <laughs> I, you never it ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. It's not happening. So we have, they'll, they'll probably say you can't stay here. You got to go, lady. <laughs> You're too old. You can't help us out at all. <laughs> Nah, well. I would be happy writing in a young artist do my music. You know what I mean? We actually, um, we wrote quite a few songs through the last year. And one of the songs that we wrote is called We the People. And we did it back in May. And of course, we're tweaking it because it's not like we're really out there yet. Yeah. But it's a good song. It, it is about what's going on today and um, just all the control and and, and lost sight of, you know, what we really should be as humans and the kindness and everything like that. And the government run the way it is. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good song. I actually put the preamble in my uh, pre-course. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. yeah. We wrote one, we, I uh, sure we wrote one. Uh, it's it's going to be, it's on the next CD, but it's, I was called Write This Wrong. They've already played it on the radio. And uh, I heard it. you heard it. It's pretty good. Cool. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't get too uh, sociopolitical in my writing. Um, I write. I mean, I write about stuff that I know or experience or witness, and sometimes it's just straight up out of my imagination, which uh, it can be kind of an interesting place. Um, but there's a couple songs that I wrote that I'm kind of proud of. Um, one is a song called A Christmas for All. It's a Christmas song, but it's just kind of a um, just kind of a reminder that not everybody has, you know, that super happy Christmas. Sometimes even the people who are surrounded by the big home and the fireplace and all the trappings and trimmings. And they still, it's a, it's not a, it's not a joyful time because everybody, you know, has different, different uh, baggage to carry, I guess. And then there are a lot of people who are just without. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that song. And, uh, and I wrote another one recently called One More Day With You, which is another kind of an introspective uh, thing about loss. Like, uh, you know, it doesn't really specify how the loss came about, but uh, essentially the, the, uh, the, the core of the song is, you know, uh, I, I would, if I had just one wish, I'd wish for one more day with you. Um, both of those, I have videos on my YouTube channel if you wanted to check them out. But uh, um, those are two that, um, yeah, that. I'm, I'm pretty proud of. Um, I'll check so it out. I'd say one of those. Yeah, I'd say I, one of I, those. I got to say something about you, Charlie, uh, at the rehearsal the other day. Um, I I noticed. Well, I've noticed before when we came down to see you in Memphis and all that, and I and from seeing you on stage before. And when you're talking about when you start, when you when the music, blues music spoke to you, mm -hmm. and I could tell that uh, you started off early because of some people, you could tell that they you're. I think, I don't know if you're reincarnation or what, or I don't know of who or whatever, but I listen to you sing and I'm listening to him play. And I'm like, 
somewhere somebody is like channeling, channeling, I don't know who or what could be anybody obscure. We don't know because a lot of folks, you know, but I, 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 I hear it in your voice. I hear it in your playing and it just, it blew me. It just blows me away. And I, I, um, you're real. Yep. You know, it's, I, you know, I, I appreciate it. those kind words for both of you I, ladies. I hear, I, it's just, you just blow it. Charlie, we're out tell, he just blows me away. I'm just telling you, honey, it, it's. You're effortless. You just yeah, jump it, it, it's, it, it's, it's. Influent. Part of it's, it's, it's you. Mm -hmm. it, it's you. Like some, some, like I said, some of the people, they, they hear something and at an early age and they kind of like, it's speaks to you from right in here and you said it and you felt it. So you have it. You've got it. Whatever. Well, got it. I, 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 I don't know what to say in response to that other than thank you. That, uh, that means an awful lot uh, coming from both, both Tina and Stevie, because you guys are, you're two of the most dynamic vocalists in, in the city and beyond. Um, but <laughs> thank uh you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I don't know where it comes from, you know, so it's a puzzle to me too. I mean, I'm second generation American from Eastern European roots. I doubt it came from there, but who knows? It may have, that, that wasn't an easy, that wasn't an easy path either. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I would compare it, but um, you know, I, heck I grew up listening to polkas. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and, Somebody said and if it country wasn't for music. The blues, we all be playing polkas. <laughs> yeah, well, I got so a good, I got a good well, jump then, on that too. <laughs> thank God for the blues. <laughs> it's funny, my uncle right. played. <laughs> I, my mother, my, indeed. My, my mother was born and raised in Carnegie, and her brother, my uncle, played the trumpet, and he played in a polka band. Back nice. in the, the he's he was in a polka band, and I. My mother's brother, and he's. I said, "Aren't there any pictures?" He says, "No, because they didn't want him in the pictures." But he would take the pictures. He was, you know, he's African American, but he wasn't supposed to be, you know. But he was there. He played. He did yeah. all those. He played those polka bands back then. But yeah, that's, my mom. We could pay hey, polka. That's that Carnegie. Everybody was kind of more together. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I I moved here to Western Pennsylvania in '85. Uh, uh, just from right down the river in Ohio. And uh, I was probably 26 years old before I went to a wedding reception that didn't feature a polka band. <laughs> How funny is that? I was actually in the wedding. It was a, a, a fellow that I worked with. It was at a country, it was a country club affair and we're eating dinner and there's this like string quartet you know it was like really beautiful and i looked at him i was like well where's the band set up and he's like well there's the band right there i'm like no i mean like for the reception he goes oh we got a dj like and that was like it just blew my mind i'm like who uses a dj where's the polka band <laughs> see i thought you were going to talk about cookie tables <laughs> oh that, that was there too bill that was there too. Because you don't have to go. I mean, that that extends way down the river as well. Okay. Yeah, that's it's for. Yeah, yeah, it's a table. Yeah. <laughs> um. Tomorrow night is going to be this. This whole season two is, except for the fourth week, is completely different than season one. Because, you know, the first week was singer songwriters and they got mm -hmm. up on stage and they played two or three songs. Um, you guys are going to be um, performing with a house band, basically. Um, mm -hmm. But what, yeah. when each of you are up on stage, what are we going to see and hear from you? Hmm. <laughs> Polkas for me. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> 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 Nothing but polkas. Nothing but polkas. You're gonna see and hear good stuff from good looking people. <laughs> we yeah, we're gonna have it's 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 gonna be a party, I think. Yeah. Um we're gonna have a good time. You're gonna see um some really some uh good vocalists. When we met the other night, she's really good. I'm not gonna tell you who she is, but she'll be on there and of course um some good musicians. We're just gonna have a. We're just gonna have fun, 
And um, I, I'm probably going to, you're, you're going to do some bunch of blues, of course. I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm going to do um, the one, the first blues that was actually written down on tablature. It was written down. I'm going to do a version of his song, W.C. Handy's tune. So, uh, is that the one I'm doing? Yeah, I think that's what I'm doing. I think that's the one I'm doing. What did I rehearse? Do you remember? I'm, <laughs> I'm losing my mind. But I think that's the one. <laughs> I think, doing I, think I was on the phone. Well, apparently, <laughs> I never came to learn Jesus on the main line, and that wasn't what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, that's why you said so that's what she, we thought you were. We thought she was going to do Jesus on the main line, and I'm saying, okay. I like Okay, and then you start saying something else. I said, I don't know where heck she got that from, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and we could do that for an encore. Yep, sure can. That would be awesome. I love that. And then, love that and then, song. And then call them up and tell them what you want, and call them up and tell them what you want after that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But it's gonna be a fun night. So. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna hear a good mix, Bill, of uh, covers and and some uh, originals as well. Uh, I'll be featuring two originals that will be coming out on my new record. I guess this is a good place in time to plug my new record, which uh, and, I'm and, just getting ready to order the discs. And and each of you, Charlie first, because he's bringing up, should mention yes. mention where we can find you online so they can track down your, your music. Okay. Hey, oh, Charlie. yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, right now the easiest place to find me is uh, – my artist page on Facebook, which is Charlie Barath Harmonica, you can, uh, I do have a, uh, not super populated, but I do have uh, some videos on my YouTube channel. Uh, I have some stuff on my Bandcamp page that you can listen to or download. Uh, and I have a website, also Charlie Barath Harmonica, that's being built as we speak. So, uh then uh, this this record of mine will be available probably within the next month. It'll take probably three or four weeks to order it. Um, so uh, I'm I'm just finalizing the artwork uh, on that uh, now. Actually, I'm waiting waiting for my uh, designer to call me and tell me he's got the final version ready for me to peruse. <laughs> congratulations! Yes, congratulations! Okay, Can't I'm ex- I'm Can't excited wait. about. It. It's uh, it's not your typical record. It's 17 songs, and 16 of them are originals. Ooh, um, that's it. And uh, yep. it's got a wide variety of blues, full-on country band with a pedal steel, swing music, uh, old-time acoustic duo stuff. Um, it's got a pretty wide variety of stuff. 20 different musicians. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get it in people's hands and in their ears. Right. 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 About you, Tina. <laughs> well, you could go. You could find uh, Tina Daniels' band on Google, and we also have the Facebook, and we have some of our songs uploaded on our YouTube page as well. And uh, one of our videos that we played at the last SOS <laughs> Save Our Stages, um, Smack Dab, is up there too. Yeah, we I have, saw those, vid- those videos. Those videos are great. <laughs> Great to Tom has all of our production and producing and videoing and editing and everything, and, and he's a perfectionist, so it's like, come on, let's go. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh. oh, your turn, You're Stevie. <laughs> oh, okay, let's see. Uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook, you can find me with Cheryl, uh, our duo and band, of course. Uh, as the um, we're called Soulful Femme. And you can see us at our website, www.soulfulfemme.com. It's soulful, F-E-M-M-E, you know, French for woman. So soulfulfemme.com. We have video everywhere, YouTube. Um, You can see us on our our website. There's video, pictures, bios, everything. Uh, We do have, um, we have some singles that were out. Uh, but these are go- also going on our um, newest CD. It's coming out, I think, we're trying to get it out at the beginning of June, end of May, beginning of June. Uh, we've ordered them, so 
you know, it's all done, mixed, everything's done. Uh, it's called uh, It Is Well With My Soul. That's the name of the CD, title of the CD. It's also um, the only cover, you know, of the song, because everything is all original. Um, we have a lot of musicians on ours as well. Um, it was recorded here at Cheryl's. It was also recorded down at uh, Studio L in uh, West Virginia. Rick Wachowski. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, some things were written also by, we have some co-writers, Mark Byers. You'll meet him tomorrow. He's performing tomorrow. You'll see him. And uh, yeah, check just, everybody check us out. See Tina's video. I can't wait for Charlie's. I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be great. All this great music. That's what 12 months of shutdown will get you. <laughs> hey, sure. you know, hey, if it wasn't for that, I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for recording, and we've got some gigs we're doing, but if it wasn't for like being in the studio, you know, I'd be, I couldn't be able, wouldn't be able to sing because that's what's keeping me, keeping the chops up too, you know, going in the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, let me think. I, I, I kind of, I'm going to ask it. <laughs> uh -oh. So, well, it, it's an odd, first of all, like, as you've noticed, a lot of my questions have stories behind them. Um, this one, I asked a band, um, from Denton, Texas, and they're a metal band. And I asked them, and, and it's named after them now. It's, it's the Diesel Beast question. <laughs> um, don't get scared. It isn't. <laughs> um, I asked them if they could play with any any band and any location. So, like, go up and, and either play with the band or open and share a show with a band anywhere in the world. Where would they play and who would they want to play with? Well, their answer was they wanted to play at Stonehenge with Dio. And that's kind of hard to top for if you're a metal band. I mean, first of all, you're going to Stonehenge, and second, you're playing with Dio. But <laughs> So I'm interested to see what you guys would come up with, with for that question. Where, where would you want to play? I mean, it could be – it doesn't even have to be a normal venue. It could just be somewhere that you think would would, would be fun to play at. Oh. <laughs> I can play somewhere in Europe. Me and Cheryl, Cheryl playing her guitar, me singing along with Eric Gales. That that may have been the fastest answer tonight. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, I dig I dig Eric Gales. That man can play some guitar. I like his music writing. I like what he sings. I like his, his, seeing him with his wife and then performing at the Blues Music Awards. We saw them live. It just and I met him too. <sighs> It's like, yeah, any stage, anywhere in Europe, because they like the blues in Europe. Oh, I know Nepal. Is it Nepal? A friend of ours, he's called the Himalayan Hendrix. His name is Ashish Dangal. We played a show for him. We met him down in Memphis. We played a show for him. I would love to go there and play with Eric Gales and Cheryl. So for them. <laughs> That's it. I don't think it matters much where I would play, but I would love to play, even though they don't really exist much anymore, as the Allman Brothers. They're just one of my favorite bands. You know, I never missed any of their shows here when they used to come. They came every year on my birthday, so it was a big You're deal. Mm. <laughs> yeah. mm. I, I don't really need to go anywhere exotic, but uh, they are uh, in the process <clears throat> they, there's been an effort to save the house that Muddy Waters lived in in Chicago, oh. which was literally falling down. And, uh, and I think it was one of his daughters who was behind the effort, but they were able to acquire it. And now they are raising money and they are going to convert it into the Muddy Waters Museum. It's, it's actually the house where they would practice and write songs in the basement, you know, Willie Dixon and, and little Walter and all those cats. Um, that would be something. I would, I don't care who I'd play with, but I'd love to play the grand opening of that. 
you could put me up first when nobody's paying attention. Wouldn't matter. <laughs> when you start playing, they they perk up and say, "Oh, like that," because you'd be playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to end things. Well, I'm going to ask two more questions because I don't want to end it on this question, but I want to ask it. Okay. Um, and I'll give you the story behind it. I really like the band Aerosmith, which also clearly is blues-based rock. Yep. Um, and I finally got to go see them at Star Lake that wasn't called Star Lake then, but Star Lake. <laughs> And yeah. they were playing. We all call it Star Lake. That's that's <laughs> because it's Star Lake. We all call it Star Lake. Yeah, Star Lake. Now. And um, I went to see them with Kiss, which is really my favorite rock band. But um, they were alternating nights. Who was who was going to play first and who was headlining? And of course, in Pittsburgh, Aerosmith was the headliner, which mm -hmm. normally I would have been one hundred percent okay with, except I think. I think Steven was sick <laughs> and Ooh. Joe Perry sang most of the leads. And, um, it was the, it was when they released their honking on Bobo album, which was a blues album. So they're with kiss with all the pyro and the flying and the blood spitting. And they were sitting on stools playing blues and it just wasn't a good mix for me. And then when you threw in that, <laughs> that Steven really wasn't doing the singing. And then they only played a 40 minute set. So in my music history, and I don't hold it against them because I still love Aerosmith, but that was the worst concert I ever went to because I had high hopes and then it all just crumbled. So my question for you is what was the worst show you've been at? <laughs> I can't, hmm. I can't really say there was a show that I didn't have a good time and the band didn't sound good. Yeah. I'm there were quite a few that I don't remember being there. Yeah. <laughs> you could count that. <laughs> I will say, you know, so back in the day when I lived uh, in Ohio across the river from Wheeling, uh, I went to virtually all the concerts that I could uh, at the Capitol Music Hall or the Civic Center. Uh, I think when I was... 15, I saw ACDC at the Capitol Music Hall. Uh, that was the uh, Let There Be Rock tour. As a 15-year-old, mind blown. I mean, Angus was nonstop head banging. I mean, it was, it was amazing. So I went to see them in subsequent tours in following years um, before Bon Scott died. Uh, but that that was the standout show everyone after that they were so loaded especially bon scott just so constantly wasted that it's like it wasn't it wasn't good i mean some of like so if they did uh some of their newer songs of the record they were supporting in that tour they were doing okay but if they tried some of their earlier stuff which was a little more high energy they couldn't keep it together. They were all over the place. That's, you know, those a couple of those ACDC gigs stand out to me as disappointing. Uh, that's not to say that some of the ones I don't remember were even worse because they might have been. <laughs> hmm. I remember, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm a lover of prog rock, um, progressive rock. That's, I went to those, I went to see Yes, Genesis, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Jethro Tall, Rush, all those folks. Back in the day, I did well, but then I also like the, the funk groups, and I remember going to see Parliament Funkadelic Parliament for the first time, and they and then they came back, kept coming back, and I think the worst show that I was there at that one time because everybody was wasted on stage. I said, "What in the heck are you guys doing?" It, everybody was hot, and and I, you know, because the show that they did, the first show they did here in Pittsburgh back then at the Civic Arena. I guess you couldn't really top it because it it was fantastic. And then it came back, it was like, what happened? <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> what happened? What happened? They everybody was wasted. That kind of that that messes things up when you get high, I guess it's not all what you you know, 
I sing it sure right, does. I high, right, great music on the high. I said, not, no, you're not. Not really. <laughs> no, you, no, you don't. <laughs> no, no. So that was the worst they got. But everybody else was good. Even if they, if they, even if they were kind of, uh, they may have been wasted too. I don't know. But they were noticeably wasted. So it was pretty bad. Um, probably, I know my wife's answer. I don't even have to ask her. Um, and I would not consider it a bad concert, but we went again to see Kiss and they were playing with Motley Crue and, um, <laughs> partway through Motley Crue's set, she turned to me and said, don't ever ask me to see this band again. <laughs> so not a Motley Crue fan. <laughs> oh, well, and coincidentally, that was my second time seeing Motley Crue, so I, yeah, I was okay. Yeah, with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, the first first shows is they were really great, and you're supposed to top. Like, how can you top that? Well, sometimes it just doesn't quite go that way. Kind of. And mm -hmm. probably, you guys talked about good shows, so I'm going to throw a good one in too because I don't want to leave it on a downer, which is why I said I was going <laughs> to ask another question. Um. This, I, I saw this show at it was the Washington County Wing um, Wing Festival, and you're laughing. Wait until you hear who it was. I was with the local band Doppler Effect. Are you guys familiar with them? They're they're phenomenal. If you're not, um, but I went with them at the time. I was I was designing their website, and they opened for Charlie Daniels. We were at a Wing Fest, and Charlie Daniels was on stage playing. It was probably the highlight of 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 my year. I mean, it it was it was just awesome to see the band that I was friends with, and then Charlie Daniels was on stage next. I was like, that just blew me away. And then to see him play "The Devil Went Down to Georgia" live, I mean, he was good. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah, but that was really good. Daniels in 1984. He was with Alabama, and and. Uh, and I think it was at the Civic Arena. I think that's where I saw them. Yeah. It was at the Civic Arena. I mean, I went for Charlie Daniels. And uh, and it was a good show. And the devil went down to Georgia, exactly. Wow. It was definitely energizing. It was a good show. I was young. I was like 18. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those young days. But yeah, uh, oh, what, what by the way, wait. we're opening for Anna Popovich next month. forgot about that. Check her out. You see her before. What year did you say? 84? I think it was 84. It, maybe 86. 80, somewhere there. I was old. 84? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure you want me to tell you how old I was. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, no, I was still in my 20s in 84. In 84, I, well, depending on how late in 84, I might have been seven. <laughs> <laughs> I was 18. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, geez. I'm not going to ask you, Charlie. He's 23. What? You have the oldest person here. Yeah. How you like that? And probably oh, well. the most immature. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> it kind of works. Like, if, you, if you say so, that I guess it kind of works. You know, old, immature. <laughs> Okay. Yes, indeed. Yeah, right, so, oh my gosh! Yeah, so, yeah, so, I, yeah. I don't try to hide. It. I don't try to hide. It. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 59. I'm going to hit the big 60 before the end of this year. So good for you. I passed the 60. Yeah. A, a lot of people. A lot of people uh, like to. Uh, they don't like to celebrate birthdays. I'm happy to see another one come around because I Me know too, too many people who don't get them anymore. That's right. It could be the other. Yeah. My mother says, you know, getting old is not for the faint of heart. But she recommends it. It's for the blessed. She, yes, she's 80. She'll be 89. So. Oh, oh bless her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first concert I ever saw, like real concert, other than all those polka bands I grew up around. Um, I went to see it. I was, I think I was, I had just turned 15 maybe, or about to turn 15. Um, went to see Emerson Lake and Palmer yes. and the Wheeling Civic Center. Um, 
they didn't have a they didn't have an opener. They played three hours themselves with a short intermission. And uh, when they came back from the break, they rose up on a like an elevator out of the middle of the stage, singing Carnival Number no. Nine. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Yes. It was. I mean, it was a for three guys. I was yes. just simply I blown away. Show. They, amazing amazing oh yeah yeah oh, first cool. that was my first real concert and i was just you know i was knocked out and i was hooked after that yeah they they just oh they, they opened the at civic arena they had that night they opened up the the dome open the top yeah yeah it was up for yes I did, I did in there. Yes. rick wakeman was rick wakeman you know with the synthesizer the move you know doing all that stuff right like that. right and, he was like, how's he doing this? Because we were in school, music school, you know, with the Moog synthesizer back then, you had to, because the keyboard was about that big, something like that, and then you had to patch. But this man was like, he had this big thing that on the stage, and he was went to town. It was like. Yeah. Yeah, I saw some pretty cool productions. I saw, you know, I saw Aerosmith. I can't, out of all the, the those rock bands of that era, I probably saw them more than any other band and uh they were all i mean very few times did they even come close to being disappointing and you know and and not really even disappointing just not they were average but that was that was the exception they were usually very good uh another band uh zz top were always entertaining uh regard and talk about three guys yeah doing a lot of noise have you seen the the documentary that came out on them? Um, no, I haven't. It's on Netflix. I think it's called it's called a little old band from Texas. Oh, oh okay, I've heard of it. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard watched, of it. I have to look it up. I've watched it like six times so far. It's just, it's just it's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, there were just some some bands back then that you know couldn't, you know, I mean maybe at least all the times I saw them never were disappointing. Cheap trick. I mean, talk about energy. Those guys brought it every single time I saw it. And I saw them a lot as well. See, tomorrow, if you want to have a long conversation, talk to Utah about Cheap Trick. He loves Cheap Trick. Yeah, I mean, I, I got a soft spot in my heart for him. And, it, and it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of sad to see those bands that you went to see in, in arenas back then and they're doing the rib the rib fest circuit you know but the 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 phenomenal thing is uh, bands like that they come out they bring it every single time they yeah. you know they don't care where they're playing how many people are out there they're up there giving you their best show and that's right. you know that's that's a tricky thing as a performer because i mean the ladies you could back me up on this i mean there are times when you know you got a gig you know you might not be you might be under the weather. You might have something else on your mind. You might just not be in a really personable mood, but like you get to, you get to figure it out. And, uh, you know, I, I've somehow always managed that once I hit the bandstand to, uh, you know, to just kind of get immersed in the music and, uh, engage the crowd and, uh, you know, and get through it. So, you know, I think of these bit, these bands that have such a heavy touring schedule, uh, you know that that's I know that's not easy to do day in and day out. It's not. Listen, it's I, not. I I tell that story about Aerosmith being the worst concert I, I've ever seen, but I would one hundred percent go see them again and give them a second chance just because I know the history and I've listened to the albums and I, I know and you know being involved in the, the scene like I am, I know that you know there are things that that happen and. Yeah. Now, now my wife, well, she's not going to see Motley Crue again, guaranteed. Probably not. <laughs> well, but how how uh, how different might it have been, Bill, if it was just Aerosmith and not a double bill with Kiss? Right. Yeah. And, and there's that too, because you know, I like I said, Kiss is is the band for me, and yeah, to have them play before Aerosmith, and you know, it was their normal bombastic fireworks and 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 throwing the flaming sword and and then Aerosmith comes on stage and they're sitting on stools and it looks <laughs> looks like Bourbon Street 
So, <laughs> so it could have been some of that too. <laughs> My God. Well, I, I, I let you know that. And uh, the, uh, previously I mentioned the documentary lightning in a bottle. Aerosmith is in that as well. in that concert show as well. So check them out. They do King B as opposed to Queen B. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really something to see. They're good. Yeah, they're in that as well. So check that out too. All right. So this last cool. question I have for you guys could either be the easiest or the hardest. And I apologize either way. <laughs> okay. So the um, SOS PGH concert series, Blues Night, is tomorrow at 6 p.m. And uh, you can get tickets by going to SOS 2020 PGH dot org slash concerts it's ten dollars you get last season this season and like 70 video on demand um tracks um video for local musicians um the question though is because all of this came from eric rogers song um sos 2020 and everything is benefiting the neva um uh relief fund emergency relief fund um, if you were sitting in front of a venue owner right now, what would you tell them? So it's hard because it's open ended and it's hard because of the topic. And I apologize before I asked it. <laughs> well, I, I think I know what it <laughs> yeah. that's get up on the stages, but they don't really have much choice either right now. I think that they want to get out there, just get, you know, open up just as much as we want to get back out there. Agree? Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is hurting them too. Yeah. It, it's, 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 uh, it's hurting them. It's hurting all of us, but I'll tell you, um, people want to be safe uh, and, and all that. I understand. And, it's just, it's just a hard, it's just been a hard pill to swallow. So we want to get on stage. We want to, um, you know, keep go doing our craft as much as possible. And we'll help them if they help, we'll help, we'll help each other. Uh, well, I'm talking this, you know, sir or ma'am, let's help each other out. We'll play, we'll get this thing going, get help you get to build you back up, whatever we need to, we'll do what we have to do. We're all in this together. That's yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sadly, there are a lot of them that uh, haven't made it through this and uh, there probably will be more to, uh, you know, kind of drop off the table moving forward yeah. because I mean, this isn't going to, this isn't going to end like flipping a switch. No. It's going to take some time and cooperation. Um, I would, you know, if I were speaking to any venue or any business owner for that matter, first and foremost, I'd thank them for what they've done up to this point and thank them for hanging on as long as they have. And, uh, you know, just encourage them to, you know, keep the faith. And, you know, if there's anything, you know, certainly that any, any band or musician or artist can do to ke help keep their favorite venue open, you know, most often they're going to do it. I mean, that was, we, we witnessed that a couple of weeks ago with the moon dogs benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable Which was a the uh, turnout, unbelievable. turnout for Pittsburgh. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Unbelievable. And uh, I know it, it, uh, you know, just knocked, knocked Ronnie's socks off when he, you know, through the whole process. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's like we are, we're all in this together. Um, there are a lot of people that uh, I know a lot of musicians who they don't have uh another saleable skill this is what they do and yes. they you know it's the same with venue owners and business owners that's their livelihood it's not right. just an inconvenience for them that's their that's taking care of their home and their family um mm -hmm. you know I, i've been i've been really lucky through all this i'm a carpenter by trade so you know i i've been able to go back and do some part-time work to help supplement what i've lost through music but uh not being there but uh you know it's life's life's not easy. It's a, it's a series of obstacles that we have to navigate. Absolutely. That's, I agree. I, I can, if you would have told me the last live show that I would have seen before all this hit was the one that I saw, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and it's not a knock against who it is because it was it was an amazing show and i'll tell you that in a moment but i am definitely a rock and metal guy um that that's who's gonna know who i am the most in the scene um and i'm trying to trying to expand so stuff like doing this stuff this interview tonight is awesome i love this um but i ended up on, on accident um going out and doing a photo shoot of frank Vieira, who is oh, a yeah, I frank. country artist he's great. he's a country artist and he's a great guy uh, and um like he he probably knows this now but <clears throat> that was my first ever paid photo gig <laughs> uh, <laughs> i um I've been taking photos for over 20 years, but I just took them. Like it was, it was just the thing I was doing and I always had a bad camera. And, um, John from first angel media, who is a photographer, photo, um, concert photographer sent me her backup, a picture or camera and said, you're going to start taking pictures with this because you have it. You just don't have the right equipment. So then she got food poisoning the night before she was supposed to f- go out Ooh. and do do um his show. So I ended up all the other photographers in First Angel Media were booked and she's like you have to do this and I'm like uh, no. <laughs> and then I went <laughs> and then I went and it, I had such an amazing time and I was like this is awesome I'm going to do more of this. Yeah. And, I, and the pandemic hit. and then it quit. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 for the over a year i've gone man i really want to take more pictures <laughs> but yeah country modern country is not for me because it's really just pop music with cowboy, I agree. cowboy hats <laughs> right <laughs> um now older stuff um, I, I, I've told this story on some of my podcasts in the past. Um, Johnny Horton. My dad would listen to that. He had a cassette. He would listen to that thing so much. And and I every once in a while, I was teaching social studies a couple years ago, and we were talking about the War of 1812. And, <laughs> and, I, and I got on YouTube and played the Johnny Horton song for my seventh graders. I'm like, listen, you have to hear this. It explains exactly what we're talking about today. And then they went home and played it for their parents. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's great. Um, that's a great story. But like, that was a good one. Johnny Horton, um, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, um, probably the, like Brooks and Dunn and Garth Brooks. That's probably my cutoff right around there. I love Anything Garth after Brooks. that. Took it all too, by the way. <laughs> Heard him do jazz. Heard him do some fusion. I said... Garth, Garth, yeah. Garth, Garth covered Kiss. <laughs> yeah, he's one of those. He's one of those. He's good. Now, I, I like him a lot. I, I have much respect for Garth Brooks. I really do. Um, all right, so I, I don't want to. I've had you guys on for an hour and a half. I'm having so much fun, but yeah. See, you didn't even realize it's been an I didn't hour. Even realize I'm like, oh, right there. there. Okay. Um. So I don't want to let you go, and um, I will be watching from home. Um. So I'll be there rooting you on. Um, we'll say hi. <laughs> and uh, hi. I keep telling everyone that I'm going to be there on metal night. That's that's the cutoff. I've had enough of sitting at home. But <laughs> we'll see how that goes. That's the goal. <laughs> All right. All right. But, well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having us on, the, on your and, show. This is yeah. wonderful. Yes, indeed, Bill. Appreciate it. And um, – being blues artists, I can definitely do an interview on PA Rock Show, but you really fit in on my three questions in a song, which is any genre from anywhere. Um, that one is literally, there's three questions that you have to answer. You talk about your song, we play your song. Um, so that's a short one. <laughs> so okay. if, if you guys are interested in doing that, let me know. Um, sure. And then I like can You got my email. I, I yeah, also, mine. I also have, yeah. I do, and I also have the streaming radio station. If if you want me to throw some music up on there, I can do that as well. Sure. So. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Right. right. So, oh, yeah. for those of you that are uh, listening, don't forget if you don't have your tickets, it's sos twenty twenty pgh dot org slash concerts. It's ten dollars. 
Go do it now so that tomorrow when you get home from work, you can hang out and listen to the blues from your living room or your car. I did that one time last season. Um, <laughs> I listened to Black Ridge, which is they kind of have a bluesy funk sound. I was okay. coming home late from work. I put it up on my phone, set it on the seat beside me and listened to their set as I was coming home. So that's the cool thing about live streaming. You can do it from anywhere. Just don't hold that's it in true. front of you while you're driving. That's not a good idea. No, that's not <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a live stream every Wednesday from my car at 6 p.m. Eastern called Cartoons with Charlie Barath. I've been doing oh, it oh, since I have to the check shutdown. That out. Oh, I have to check that out. I didn't know that. Shut- I've only missed four times. Uh, actually, I missed today would be the fifth time because I had uh, something come up and I needed to get ready for this. So, uh, but yeah, typically I am, I'm there, um, every Wednesday at six. And and that's that's on your YouTube or on your Facebook? No, that, that's through my uh, Facebook artist page, Charlie Barath Harmonica. Okay. Okay. So you follow that page and, and then, you know, click the notification button and you'll get notified whenever I go live. My, uh, my regular listeners are probably mad because I kind of bagged today's. (laughs) <laughs> but uh i'll have to uh i'll have to put together an extra special show for next week cool all right all so right. if you guys hang out for one moment i'm going to sign okay. off and then i'll give you a little bit more information about my podcast and then i'll let you go <laughs> all right all right cool. so once again make sure you pick up your tickets um you get both get seasons ticket, ticket. <laughs> um you get both seasons season one and season two and I think there is at least 72 um, music videos in the video on demand section. Um, it's well worth the money. Um, Utah and Bob suggested last week that you purchase a second ticket because it's not really that expensive. Um, so with that said, um, make sure you check out the blues night tomorrow. And then the following week is jazz night. And then on the 29th, the end of season two is metal night with scale Winner's Descent, and oh, I knew I was going to do that. Scout, Winner's <laughs> Descent, and Insta-Kill. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, and then Thursday the concert is at 6 p.m.